Good morning all, near and far. Mayor of Seattle, Iceland's Minister of Business and Culture, Excellencies, everyone. Rosala Kamana Vermegur. Great to be here with you. Uh, last night I had also the honor of attending a session here where brilliant companies uh, told us how they were going to move forward, uh, what their innovations were. And I mentioned then how great I felt that we're talking about the future, we're talking about innovation, new techniques in a museum where we look backwards on our history. And in the spirit of sustainability and recycling, I repeat these words. We sometimes also need to recycle our speeches. But I'm not going to bore you, though. I'm not going to tire you by repeating word for word what I said. And after all, I'm the president. I can say what I want. <laughs> and I'm a historian. And it is my passion to uh, emphasize that we need to learn from the past as we look forward to the future. So I'm going to talk about, yes, innovation, independence, and interdependence. And I want you to go with me on a journey. We can call it from the very beginnings to the present, if you like. But I'm going to give you examples of five innovations and how they have affected us and what we can learn from them to make this world a better place. They're practically random. There's hardly any connection between them, except though they all connect to Iceland somehow. You have to forgive me. I'm the president of the country. <laughs> so we're going to talk about long ships, the Viking ships. We're going to talk about vellum or calfskin. We're going to talk about Coast Guard wire cutters. And I can see heads rolling. What on earth is that? We're going to talk about geothermal energy. And finally, the future of Icelandic in the digital age. So the long ships, they were built in Scandinavia uh, more than a thousand years ago, developed. So by the ninth century or so, the people there had to develop these smart, fast sailing ships that could take you over the open ocean. So they traveled the Norse on these vessels, the long ships from Scandinavia, from Norway, over to the British Isles, onwards to the Faroe Islands, to Iceland, and finally to this great continent in which we find ourselves now. Uh, we have celebrated these daring voyages, this trip into the unknown. So here in the US, on the 9th of October, every year, we celebrate Leif Eriksson Day. And I'm not being promoted here by the company to mention it. It's a coincidence. <laughs> it's Leif Eriksson Day on the 9th of October. Because Leif Eriksson, or Leif the Lucky, was one of those Norse men who sailed onwards from Greenland and discovering uh, lands further east. 9th of October. Now, why 9th of October? Well, in 1825, the first group of immigrants from Norway arrived from Stavanger uh, on the uh, uh, eastern shores of the US. So that's the connection, Leif Eriksson, group of Norwegian immigrants. And ever since the uh, mid-1960s, we've celebrated Leif Eriksson Day. So on 9th of October, every year, the President of the United States issues a proclamation declaring this to be Leif Eriksson Day when you celebrate the voyages of the Norse over to what we now know as North America. All well and good. Well, not all well and good. In 1975, there was tension in the relationship between Iceland and the United States. Court war was brewing, and I'll come to that a bit later on, fishing disputes between Iceland and, and Britain. And on the 9th of October, the President of the US in 1975, uh, Gerald Ford, issued a proclamation on Leif Eriksson Day, honoring the achievements of Leif Eriksson, 
the son of Norway. <laughs> the son of Norway. The ambassador of Iceland in Washington, D.C., demanded a change, an apology. Leif Eriksson, or to be precise and correct, Leivur Eriksson was not a Norwegian. <laughs> he was an Icelander, and you need to correct this. And this was sensitive, this was difficult. Keep in mind a Cod War connection. We need to keep the Icelanders happy. So, how do you solve this? We have diplomats in the room. Their job is to find solutions, find compromises, find ways out, reduce tension. So, the next presidential proclamation on Leif Eriksson Day, and ever since, has contained these good words. And you can see the last one from President Biden last year. On Leif Eriksson Day, we celebrate the achievements of the Norse voyagers, and especially Leif Eriksson, a son of Iceland and grandson of Norway. <laughs> Talk about diplomatic smartness. Now, that's all well and good. But if we want to take a closer look at this history, we know for a fact that Leif Eriksson or Leiver Eriksson moved from Iceland to Greenland at the age of three. So if we want to issue Leif Eriksson with a passport, it might as well be a Greenlandic one. Furthermore, this is all good. These stories of daring voyages across uncharted waters, we could celebrate those and we should celebrate those. But we need to avoid the temptation of claiming or celebrating that these good people from well over a thousand years ago, discovered a new continent, as if it were a terra incognita, where nobody lived. I understand that we are now on land uh, that was inhabited or is inhabited by the Coast Salish people, including the Duwamish people. So we must avoid the old temptation, the old thinking, that by honoring Leif Eriksson, we're honoring those who discovered this continent. No, we can celebrate these voyages, these daring voyages, but at the same time acknowledge that there were people here whom they actually met. Uh, well, it's easy. We can do both. We can always find the compromises. We don't even need the diplomats. Celebrate the achievement, acknowledge those who were here. And we could also mention a female voyager, Guðríður Þorbjarnardóttir, who also sailed uh, eastwards with this daring group of, of uh, people from the Nordic region. So we can celebrate the uh, skills and the bravery without belittling or denying the existence of those who were here before us. And we can always, as well, quote Oscar Wilde. Ah, yeah, the Vikings, smart people. They discovered America, but they were wise enough to keep quiet about it. <laughs> and the capability of making fun of yourself is an essential capability uh, in uh, the world as it is today. So I hope I'm forgiven to, uh, to mentioning this over here. Now, it connects also with independence and interdependence, because we want to be able to celebrate achievements of the past, but we must never be arrogant. We must never be uh, negative. And uh, the kind of nationalism we want to develop must be without uh, those uh, aspects. We need to celebrate diversity, plurality, and uh, uh, respect for others. So that were, those were the long ships. One innovation that connects in this manner with independence and independence, interdependence, and we remember the achievements of Leivur Eriksson, the son of Iceland and grandson of Norway. How do we know? What do we know? Why do we know these stories? Why do we know what happened? That moves us on to vellum or calfskin, because, yes, we have archaeological remains, especially at uh, Lanzo Meadows in uh, Newfoundland, demonstrating or proving that people from the Nordic region moved over to that part of the uh, world uh, around the year 1000. But we have the sagas, the Icelandic sagas, wonderful tales of voyages and, yes, battles and feuds, all kinds of slayings, but love as well, 
and uh, honor and bravery. And stories of kings, the kings of Norway and all the parts of the Scandinavian region. Stories of the ancient faith, stories of Odin and Thor, Freya, Frigg, Loki. You come across these in the Avengers movies, and it's not Loki, it's Loki. <laughs> and it's Ausgarður, not Asgard. But we forgive you, Icelandic is difficult to pronounce. We have all these tales, and one of the giant in Icelandic literature is a man by the name of Snorri Sturluson, a chieftain in Iceland and a writer. He compiled, gathered stories of the heathen faith and the Norwegian kings, the Eddas, and we have the sagas as well, all the Icelandic sagas. Snorri uh, had in his domain the good place of Bessastadir, what is now the presidential residence uh, in Iceland. And in the uh, early and mid 13th century, there was a volcanic eruption nearby, and his livestock fell because of the volcanic ash and the fumes. And so he had loads of dead calves. And what do you do with the dead calves? You get the skin and you write these tales on it. So every cloud has a silver lining. There might be a volcanic eruption in Iceland now as we speak. Let us hope and pray that it will not be harmful if it happens to uh, lives and infrastructure. But in the 13th century, a side effect of a volcanic eruption was an immense uh, amount of calfskin. So we wrote the stories on the calfskin, kept them like that. These stories are not written in isolation. Yes, they are unique. Uh, they are Iceland's contribution to world civilization, along with uh, skir, the yogurt drink, and fermented shark. But these stories are unique, but they're also based on a common European heritage. So it's a perfect example of the combination of independent, independence and interdependence. Uh, what we need to be aware of as we applaud this national cultural heritage is to guard it against people who are willing to abuse it for their extremist purposes, who uh, misinterpret the sagas and our cultural heritage as a demonstration of supremacy of one group of people over another. We need to defend Asgard against those extremists. And how do we do that? We do it by demonstrating and proving that the cultural heritage is not about that. It's not about supremacy of one group of people over another. No, far from that. Look at the gods in detail, and you'll find one of the gods enjoyed cross-dressing, for instance. And the stories emphasize honor and dignity, not violence, not hatred towards others. So. Uh, that's what I would like to emphasize uh, there. And furthermore, the Icelandic sagas and this cultural heritage emphasizes, yes, independence, that's one part of my theme, personal independence. And I connect it with the Nordic welfare model where we want to make sure that every individual, however that person may be, can get a chance to thrive and prosper to have a dream and work towards that dream, get the space needed for that. But also, if you need assistance, if you need help, we are there for you. You're not on your own. Try your best, do your best, make your dreams come true. But if you need assistance, we're there for you. That's the Nordic model in essence. Individual responsibility, individual freedom, collective duties. This is how we should work things. This is the message from the Nordic region to everyone who wants to hear us. And it's based partly on our common cultural heritage, the Nordic Icelandic cultural heritage. And then when the time comes, we say goodbye to those who leave. We can also quote our wisdom 
from the Nordic sagas, from the sayings of the old gods. And then we say, cattle die, kindred die. Everyone is mortal. But the good name never dies of one who has done well. This is what we can bring from the Nordic heritage to our contemporary world. So, longships, calfskin, Coast Guard wire cutters. I felt it was like a continuation of our struggle for independence. This is what one of the uh, captains of the Icelandic Coast Guard vessels told me as I was working on my PhD dissertation about fishing disputes in the North Atlantic. And mind you, connecting the past with the present, our Coast Guard vessels are called Odin, Thor, Tyr, the War of God, and the latest one, Freya, the female goddess. Freya is the goddess of uh, love, I believe, among other things. But don't mess with Freya on the seas around Iceland. I felt this was like the continuation of the struggle for independence. We Icelanders, fortunately, know very little about wars. We don't have a military. We're proud members of NATO. And we look forward to welcoming our Nordic friends into NATO. But we're not experts on war. And sometimes that can be a blessing. We know a thing or two about court wars, however. So, independence and Iceland. Iceland became a republic in 1944. Can Iceland survive on its own? That was a question that was asked then, even among our friends. You're too small, you're too tiny, you cannot survive there on your own. Yes, we can, and we did. But we needed to gain sovereignty over our natural resources around the island. We needed to get control of our fishing grounds. And that we did in a series of steps, expanding the fishery jurisdiction around Iceland, first from three nautical miles to four, four to 12, 12 to 50, 50 to 200. And we're the there now for the time being. <laughs> now, these fishing grounds were popular with other fishing people, particularly from our friends in Britain. And they weren't that friendly at that time. They protested every move. They said, these are international waters. Freedom of the high seas must be recognized. You cannot do this. So when we moved to 12, 12 miles in 1958, the Royal Navy went up to Icelandic waters, protecting British fishing boats, the trawlers, trawlers like you can see in the Good Harbor of Seattle, protecting them from harassment from Thor and other Icelandic Coast Guard vessels. And we, we were a bit helpless then. There was very little we could do. Uh, my grandfather was, was one of those Coast Guard boats, and one of his friends would tell me, well, what could we do? We could just shout towards the trawlermen, towards the fishermen. And we said, and in Icelandic accent, you are fishing illegally, you must leave immediately. But the British trawlermen, rough as they were, but very kind people at heart, they would just say, bugger off. <laughs> and that was it. We were a bit helpless. However, we managed to gain victory there. Uh, the British had to back down. But then we moved outwards again in 1972. Later this year, we'll celebrate the fact that a half a century has passed since we moved the fishing limits to 50 miles in 1972. And again, the British protested. And again, they sent the Royal Navy to protect the British fishing vessels, the trawlers. But now, we could do more than shout, you are fishing illegally, leave immediately. No, now we could use our secret weapon. Trawling is a business whereby you drop the net, you drop the trawl, and then you haul it in. So here you have a trawl. And you here you have the sea. And imagine fish in this sea. Imagine Icelandic fish in this sea. And the trawler is somewhere here, and here's the, here's the trawl wire. So the, you get the trawl into the trawler, 
and you get the trawl full of Icelandic fish into a British trawler, and that we do not like. What's the answer? The answer is the wire cutter. <laughs> so instead of the trawl being hauled into the trawler, you have a Coast Guard vessel sailing like this, cutting the wires. So down goes the trawl with our good Icelandic fish, and you have furious trawler men on that boat, but very happy Icelandic Coast Guard skippers. This changed completely the dynamics of the situation. Instead of them catching fish and sailing onwards to Britain, we were able to do this on a multitude of occasions. And the British frigates, the British warships up there, tried to intervene. But they were not built for that. They were built for a completely different kind of warfare in the middle of the Cold War. So this secret weapon, the secret wire cutters, completely changed the dynamics of the situation. And ultimately, after a dispute over 200 miles, led to full Icelandic victory. Hooray. And this is Iceland's contribution to modern warfare. <laughs> but again, it's not you know, completely an Icelandic invention. It's based on, funnily enough, uh, you know, British uh, uh, mine-sweeping uh, mine uh, gadgets from the Second World War. But the idea is to use it in this manner is, is Icelandic. As we tell this story, we need to again acknowledge the bravery of the Icelandic Coast Guard captains and their crews who managed to do this. But if we want to explain why we, Iceland had achieved victory in these court wars, we cannot only look at that. We cannot only look at the actions of the, of the Coast Guard skippers, because the law of the sea was floating and developing in Iceland's favor. The nations of the world were also moving in this direction. So well before Iceland moved to 200 miles, many countries in uh, Latin America had taken that step. So we were also benefiting from that. And furthermore, this was in the 1970s, these later disputes, in the midst of the Cold War. And Cold War and Cold War were intertwined. The British protested. The British sent warships to Iceland. And the message from Washington, are you nuts? Iceland is a proud NATO member. There's a very important naval base, military base at Keflavik, Iceland. And they are saying, unless the British back down, we're closing down the base. So priorities are here. Put strategic security above fishing interests. So that was also our weapon, the wire cutters and the presence of a military base uh, in, the, uh, in Iceland. Now, I encourage you to come to Iceland, look at the wire cutters, and see how we managed to beat the British. Uh, I would not have amended my speech even if, I, if the ambassador of Britain would have been here. We're all friends now. But this is a story of David versus Goliath as well. And we had, it's, a, it's ingrained in our mindset, our Icelanders, to celebrate these victories. So, yes, come to Iceland and enjoy the uh, stories of court wars and uh, the Icelandic sagas, but also come to enjoy the swimming pools and the hot tubs and see firsthand how we use geothermal energy, the fourth innovation I'm going to mention. I mentioned Snorri Sturluson, the chieftain and the writer who wrote and composed and compiled and gathered tales of gods and Vikings and so on and so forth. He lived at a place called Reykholt, Smoky Hill, because it's, there's an abundance of geothermal energy there, hot water coming out of the uh, underground. And he had a hot tub there probably one of the very first hot tubs in Iceland in the mid and early 13th century. So he would sit there and think as he enjoyed the warmth of the water, like, what should I write about next? Just like we do today. Alas, he was slayed there by a band of villains. Uh, and we Icelanders all know his famous last words. 
Eigi skal höggva. Thou shall not strike. And then he died. I'll come to that again in a moment. But uh, uh, first, I want to focus on geothermal and innovation. We don't only use geothermal energy for soaking in swimming pools and hot tubs. In Iceland, we use geothermal uh, resources to heat practically all our homes. It is the cleanest energy you can wish for. It's the cleanest way to heat your homes. And yes, I readily admit that. We need to heat our homes, especially in wintertime. Furthermore, we can use geothermal energy to produce energy, clean energy. Now, it's not our innovation, of course. Others have done it before us. But in Iceland, we have a mass of knowledge, a mass of people who know a lot about how you can use geothermal energy. So this is an innovation that is more forward-looking, perhaps, than long ships and calf skin and hope as well wire cutters. And this is something I encourage you to have a close look at. The development and use of geothermal energy in Iceland and uh, how we can uh, uh, use it on our necessary journey towards a world full of clean energy and uh, where we manage to uh, combat climate change and reduce CO2 emissions. Yeah, furthermore, we know how to drill CO2 into the into, yeah, underground. It's one amazing achievement as well. Now, finally, as we move on towards the end of my speech, the digital age and the future of the Icelandic language. We're on a mission here. It's an honor to be at the Nordic Innovation Summit. Uh, but we're also here for a different purpose. My team, my Minister of Business and Culture, experts and specialists, we're on a mission. We come in peace. <laughs> Icelandic is a thriving language. It's a strong language. I'm not worried about its future. I'm optimistic. We want to speak Icelandic, the people who live in Iceland, including my wife Eliza, who was here a couple of weeks ago, born and raised in Canada, moved to Iceland, and she said to me, I'm not going to stand here and live here and keep asking, what was she saying? What is he saying? I'm going to learn this language, even though it sounds and looks silly at times. <laughs> and even though I make mistakes, as she said. And we want to foster that and encourage that for all those who want to move to Iceland and be a part of society. And then we need to help people. And we need to make technology an asset in that. Yes, it's a thriving language. We publish more books, I think, per capita, at least, than almost any other nation. And we love per capita statistics. <laughs> We're a small nation, yes. I think we have more per capita statistics than any other nation. <laughs> per capita. We have the longest river in Europe. Per capita. <laughs> but we have to be on guard. We have to be on guard. Icelandic is strong. It's thriving. We love it. We write poetry. We write crime novels, as many of you may know. And just let me reassure you that way more crimes are committed in books and on pages than in reality. Iceland is one of the safest countries in the world. And we have many statistics to prove that. And we don't even need per capita there. <laughs> but we have to be on guard. Remember what Snorri said? Eigi skal höggva, thou shall not strike. I was telling this story to a group of kids whom I took up to Reykholt, to Smoky Hill. And I said to them, and here Snorri was lying in his hot tub, and then he went in, and this group of bandits came, and they slayed him, and they said, Eigi skal höggva. And he said, Eigi skal höggva. But they still struck, and he died. End of story. And as we were driving back from Reykholt, back from Smoky Hill, I said to this group of kids, now, do you remember what I was talking about, about Snorri and how he, how he ended his life and his famous last words? And then there was one of them who said, oh, yes, yes, yeah, I remember, I remember. I remember well what he said. He said, please, ekki mig. Please, don't strike me. 
English crept in. Snorri did not say please. <laughs> and now we have this challenge. The next generation, our lovely kids, who are going to make this world a much better place for us. They play computer games and they love it. They're on YouTube, they're on the internet. And they say to each other when they're playing, Tu farta dodja? Tu farta substituta? Ye para chilla? You need to dodge. You need to substitute the player, get a new, better player on your game. I'm just chilling. And when I hear them say this, I become a bit boring and I say, I don't understand you. A totcha. I've never heard that word in Icelandic. Oh, you're saying, I need to see cover. Ég þarf að leita skjóls. And they were like, that. <laughs> this is an issue we need to tackle. Yes, we want to be cosmopolitan. We need to learn other languages, all well and good. But at the same time, we want to make sure that we can still maintain the fact that from generation and gener to generation, Icelandic continues to be understood because we can understand texts written from thousands of years ago. But if we are not careful, Icelandic will uh, suffer from the influx of the wonderful English language. So there's job to be done there. Furthermore, English uh, creeps in in other ways. And don't get me wrong, I'm, it's not a negative, uh, it's just work to be done. Uh, hey Siri, uh -huh. do you speak Icelandic? Hmm, I don't have an answer for that. Is there something else I can help with? <laughs> Siri and her friends, Alexa, and all that group of wonderful people who help us in our daily lives, they do not understand Icelandic. Our mission here is to make sure that soon we will work together to teach Siri, Alexa, and others for the benefit of ourselves, but others as well. No language should be left behind Universal Speech Translator, that's the message from Meta, and other big companies agree. And we do not come back in here, we have meetings with people from these uh, companies, and we tell them, we're in a win-win situation, if you take a close look at it. We in Iceland went on a campaign, it's not often that you ask people, talk for as long as you want, speak as much as you can, say anything you want. But this is what we did in Iceland. We want to record you, so we, we amassed a great data bank of Icelandic. And we can bring this to the table for these big companies and tell them, here's our stuff. We just need to make sure that you can put this into your uh, hardware and software, and we will both benefit from that. So I'm very optimistic that this is work to be done that will be achieved, and we will be able to talk to our phones uh, in the not too distant future. And also we can actually. We're just on a road there. Hi, no, no, all right, hold on one second. Hi, Embla. Do you speak Icelandic? Hi, Embla. Talar þú Íslensku? Hi, Embla, don't fail me now. <laughs> she needs... Hi, Embla. Talar þú Íslensku? Já, kæri nótandi. Eins og þú heyrir þá tala ég Íslensku. Takk, Embla, I love you. <laughs> Embla is there, the technique is there, the task is achievable, we just need to get going. So, 
As I conclude my speech, we have moved from long ships to the digital age. We're always innovating, and we will continue to innovate. And we will continue to be proud Icelanders, proud Norwegians, proud Danes, proud Swedes, proud Finns, proud Greenlanders, proud Faroe Islanders, proud Sami, proud entities who have their own culture, own language, own past, but at the same time, we want to keep this cultural heritage in a positive manner and also be global citizens and use history to foster friendship and plurality, diversity, not hatred, bigotry, or fear or hatred towards the other. This is our task, especially at times like this, when we see aggressors claiming territories in the name of nationalism, in the name of history that is abused. We do not want that. And let our cultures thrive, and then all shall be well. But we have to be on guard. As I said, when it comes to technology, when it comes to the evils of nationalism, when it comes to the need to stand together and defend the good cause. And I conclude by moving back to literature and culture and poetry, because we Icelanders love our poetry. And we can translate it to others. The finishing lines of a poem by Thomas Guðmundsson have captured me since I read them first as a child. They're beautiful in Icelandic. And I hope I manage to capture their essence as I translate them into English for you. But the time will come when I will be able to say it in Icelandic for you, good folks, and you will hear it in wonderful English, even better than uh, my version, my improvised version now. But these finishing lines go like this. For when there is wrong that you can put right, and when there is struggle that you stand aside, the troubles of this world are also your fault. Tak fyrir, thank you very much. Thank you.